So you all finish the second homework. Um, I hope uh, it wasn't too bad. I think my, at least from talking to folks during office hours and over email, I think some of the challenge was in constructing a total potential energy, figuring out what the right strain energy is, figuring out what the right work is. Um, and once you had that, at that point, it's just take a derivative, solve for P, take a second derivative, check for stability. And I think the second set of questions that folks had, which to be honest, I was expecting, and I didn't expect you to have the answer to was, the stability plot looks weird, right? You got the answer right. The second variation or the second derivative of your total potential energy was always negative. So what on earth does that mean? Let me get into this with two parts. The first part is when you're pushing on something with a force, the work that that force does is calculated by the, it's, you know, it's a vector. It's pointing in some direction. So you need to consider what direction is the displacement. I should say this a different way. You're taking that force and multiplying it by the displacement in the direction of the force. So for here, we had something that was like, um, here's our bar and it was hinged on a spring. There were two of them. This thing was gonna probably deflect like this. The force is acting vertically. And so the work that's done is the vertical deflection. So if this is U, then work would be P times U. Your, the work is done by take the force, it has a direction. What is the displacement in that direction? So you have to do some triangles and you know, here's an angle. We know that this is like the L. Uh, so Katoa figure out which uh, sides, of, which lengths of which lengths. So that was, I think, one thing that I wanted to just reiterate and make sure I made clear. Um, the second is going back to this question of what on earth is happening with this problem? This is a terrible structure. Is what's happening with this problem. It is a structure that doesn't really look that different from a lot of other things that you've done in this class. You know, it's a bar, there's a spring. I don't know, it doesn't look anything strange when you look at it. But this is what's we've learned a couple of different stabilities. We learned about buckling with the hinged column. And we saw that for the buckling problem. You kind of have one equilibrium path, and then you intersect with another equilibrium path, and you kind of follow this trajectory. You go up, and then you buckle either right or you buckle left. You probably got a plot for this problem that looked like you go up, and then it kind of curves down like this. This would be your force displacement curve. This is probably occurring at a value of one if you plotted P over KL. If, if not, it would be at a value of whatever you chose for K and L. But look at what this graph is saying. If you're hanging weights off this structure, so you're just putting mass here, it's hanging more and more for, uh, masses there. This is saying that once you get to this point here, the buckling load, It will the angle will grow and require less and less force for that angle to grow. So think about this graph. The angle will grow as you apply less force as soon as you cross that critical threshold. That's very it doesn't really make a ton of sense. So what it, what's actually happening and what does that mean? Well, you can figure out what that means by looking at the second derivative. And you found that your second derivative. was 
always negative. What that means is this structure is stable when you're pushing on it in this initial configuration. As soon as you get to the critical buckling point, and in fact, because this point itself is actually negative, or right, uh, if, if you kind of check it further, as soon as you get near that critical buckling point, this whole structure just collapses, just completely gets crushed. This is the simplest model that people use to describe the behavior of a soda can. You're stepping on a soda can, it's solid, no problem. You put a little extra weight on, that thing completely crushes. It's, it's what's known as, so this is a bifurcation. You're going along one path and then it forks. So we learned about the, the hinged cantilever, which forked like this. And that would be called a bifurcation is because there's a fork there. There's like a fork in the road, it's a bifurcation. The hinged cantilever is a stable bifurcation because once you get to this point, it can it can handle it. If you take, it'll be happily. There's stable equilibrium states to be found. Let's see if I found my shape somewhere in here. It's not. Um, I lost my thing. All right. Well. We can use this. The Euler buckling is a stable bifurcation because it's happy right now. I'm holding it in this configuration. For those of you at home, I'm just pushing a piece of paper together. It's buckled. It's happy in that configuration. What we just did last class for the homework was look at an unstable bifurcation because as soon as you get to that point, the structure collapses. There's no stable equilibrium after that point. It just will crush until. You know, it either has self contact in the case of a soda can or some, uh, or it finds some other, um, you know, in the case of this thing, it would just literally break the structure. Um, it's, a, it's a way for you to understand what happens when you kind of crush a, a soda can. It's also a way for you to understand that this structure is not obviously bad. When you look at it, you don't necessarily think that's a terrible structure. You have to kind of do a little investigation, calculate the energy, calculate the equilibrium and stability paths to learn, oh, wait a minute, if this thing, if I apply a force to this thing that gets close to that buckling force, this structure is going to entirely be destroyed. Um, so I, I didn't expect you to put together all the last stuff. I expected you to get here and say, huh, it's always negative. What does that mean? Uh, and if you did that, great. And this is what it means. This is an unstable. It's actually an unstable symmetric bifurcation because it doesn't really care if it goes this way or that way or this way or that way. And that, and for the case of this structure, it means it doesn't really care if, if the spring is pulled this way or if the spring is compressed this way. So it can go either way. So this is another of the, there's like four canonical instabilities. We've done three. One is snapping, one is stable symmetric bifurcation, or they're buckling. One is unstable symmetric bifurcation, which people use to model, like, or explain what's happening with cylindrical cylinder uh, cylindrical shells being being compressed. And the last one is asymmetric bifurcation, which it's a little bit it's kind of less common, so I'm not going going through it here. Um, but uh, hopefully, you're able to solve this. Hopefully, it wasn't too painful. Um, yeah. Any questions on the homework? Nothing? All right. Okay. Well, in that case, let me give you a sense of where we're at, just to remind you what we've done so far. We've learned how to uh, determine the strain energy of a, of a structure, the energy that's being stored in the structure. We've learned that the total potential energy is the strain energy plus whatever potential is occurring due to external loads. That potential is equal to the negative of the work. 
And then we learned kind of in the increasing levels of difficulty what is referred to as the principle of minimal potential energy. Which is that the first variation of your total potential energy must be at zero for your structure to be in equilibrium. Another way to think of this is that for your structure to be in equilibrium, since the total potential energy is equal to the strain energy minus the work, then for the structure being equilibrium, the strain energy in stored in the structure must be balanced. Sorry, well, this is the same thing, but let me just say it a different way. The work you're doing must be balanced by an increase in strain energy in the structure. Any work you're doing needs to be stored internally in the structure as, as an energy that can be released. You're storing it like a spring, effectively. We learned that this principle, if your system is really simple, if they have discrete one, two, three, four degrees of freedom, you have to, you can simply calculate this first variation by taking a, a first derivative. We learned that you could check for stability by taking a second derivative. And that's what this homework was allow, allowing you to practice. The next homework, which is due next Wednesday, is, is asking you to think about the principle of minimum potential energy for a, for a continuous structure. Now, when you have a continuous structure, your total potential energy takes the form of a functional. We need new tools to calculate how to minimize that functional. We learn those tools. You perturb your function by adding a small parameter to it. You typically have to integrate by parts, collect your arbitrary variation, and then set uh, whatever it multiplies equal to zero. And we learned that you actually get quite a lot of information on this for free. You get the governing equation of equilibrium, and you get the natural boundary conditions. So you're going to have a chance to basically apply this principle to a continuous structure uh, on this next homework. And just like second derivative for a, a, uh, a discrete structure tells you about stability, the second variation of a continuous structure tells you about stability. So these concepts, we're really kind of repeating the same concept, just for a slightly harder uh, V, where, where this is no longer um, just a simple function of a variable. It's a function of displacement, which is a function of position. That's a functional. We need some, some new math tools to get us there. We found that last class, we did the, the variational problem on a beam that we're pulling uh, stuck to the wall. And what you'll know, and you're gonna see this for your homework too, is that the result of this calculating this first variation here is not the answer. The result is the differential equation you need to solve to get the answer. So when you start with an energy approach, what you're trying to accomplish is to, is to find the governing equation that you need to solve. And we were fortunate enough to pick a really, really simple problem. And we could solve that analytically. And we uh, arrived at the displacement of that bar along the structure. And, it kind of, and we showed that, oh, hey, look, at the end of the bar, we recover what we learned in 305. And now we got some more information out of this by solving that differential equation. But I want to emphasize that taking this first variation, setting equal to 0, what you would get is the governing equation that you need to then go and solve. And I think 
one of the, you know, I think one of the ways that we kind of fail you uh, as, as teachers, going back through high school, but all the way up through college for sure, both in math and in particular in engineering, and I'm guilty of this as well. So this is not like me trying to pretend like I'm doing something right. I think one of the ways that we fail you is we are always showing you and assigning you and giving you problems that involve equations that you can solve. And it turns out that equations we can solve are the exception, not the rule. Like most equations, we don't know how to solve. Think about it. Like the, the we can solve the quadratic equation. That's great. If you work really hard, you can solve the cubic and the uh, quartic equations, whatever the fourth order one. Anything beyond fourth order polynomials, impossible to solve. This is Kermat's last theorem. This is, this is just, we don't have no idea how to solve any polynomial system where the exponents are five or greater. So, we, so you learn the quadratic equation in high school and it's kind of like, why are we learning this? And we're, and it's really coming from the, 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 the math side is kind of like, isn't it amazing that we can solve this equation? We can't solve any of these other ones. Look at this one that we can solve. The same thing is true as you get to engineering mechanics problems. You know, we're typically trying to reduce things to algebraic equations, like in mechanics of materials that you can solve. We, we really only know how to solve linear equations. Like, that's it. Like, most things are not linear. We really don't have any idea. The only way we solve nonlinear equations is by finding a way to convert them to linear equations in which we can, we can uh, solve them as a series of like infinite numbers of linear equations that we add up together. We have no idea. It's, it's most of the time, the work you're trying to do is to try to approximate something that we can't actually solve. And so typically when I get to this part of the class, it seems really like useless, I think, to students who are kind of like, what we're gonna work on right now is some approximate methods for figuring out the shapes of, of beams. And oftentimes I think students encounter this as kind of like, okay, like why would I, why would I need to approximate this thing? And the reason is, is because most of the time we don't get a differential equation that we can just go in and solve it by hand. Most of the time you get a differential equation that if you're lucky, Mathematica can solve numerically. Like for this thing, the equations that describe this, this sheet of paper are so profoundly hard. Like you could, there's still papers being written on like efficient ways to solve these as long as the slopes aren't too high. And, and as long as you like, don't allow there to be like anything like that. Like that's just impossible. You can tell this too by like, I mean, if you ever play video games or uh, like the animations of um, like a soccer game, if you see like the, the animations of a soccer jersey, like they're not modeling the paper, they're modeling the ball. Like the trajectory of the ball is like they're solving the equations that do that. But for like stuff like your shirt, like they just put in animations that look like a shirt. Like they don't, they, they can't solve those like efficiently. We don't know how to do it. They're a mess. They're nonlinear. They're partial differential equations. The equations for solids, fluids are an absolute nightmare. And so we really need ways to approximate things, ways to figure out what's happening in, in this regime. What's happening if this is small? we're almost always looking for ways to just kind of estimate or approximate what's happening. You know, even what's going on with finite element analysis, you're, you're really trying to find a way to kind of approximate a solution in between nodes that you mesh your structure with. And you just hope that you mesh your structure properly and that you're not missing something, any of the physics or any of the uh, assumptions you made. These things are really, really hard. And so what I want to do today, I want to go back to this idea that you saw the first variation of your, of your total potential energy, and you're going to typically end up with a differential equation. 
most of the time you're not going to be able to solve it. So what do you do? Well, we can use this idea that if this thing needs to be equal to zero, and we know that this is made up for the strain energy and the work, then therefore, if our structure is in equilibrium, the first variation of our strain energy must balance the, the first variation of our work. And perhaps we can use this to, to our advantage to kind of approximate a solution when we can't solve it. I think this was never made clear to me, this idea that we really, the equations we can solve are the exception and not the rule. The second thing that I was incredibly uncomfortable with when learning some of these things was, and it took me years to kind of just accept this, uh, was that in order to approximate or, or try to find a solution to these complicated problems, you often need to guess. And that's a really unsettling idea, I think, especially for engineers. I feel like I feel like engineers are in particular, and myself included, like really uncomfortable with the idea of like just inserting a guess as, as your as your as a way to find the solution. I want to try to help you overcome that if you have that kind of uh, uncertainty around that, and to, and to at least show you some of the ideas for how this works. And the, the cool thing is, I think the technique we're going to use is probably familiar to you. You've probably used this in a heat transfer class. Um, and it's the idea that we can use a, a Fourier series as a way to um, guess the deflection of a beam. So let me tell you what I mean by this. Let's look at a problem where it's, this is a problem you can solve exactly. This is the other thing we do. We, we say you have to approximate something and then we show you a problem that actually has an analytical solution. The reason we do this is because the only way to know if your approximation is any good is you test it on problems that we can solve, then you go and apply it on problems you can't solve. But the first thing you do when you're creating a model is you test it on a bunch of problems that you already know how to solve exactly. That way you can see if you're doing okay. This is what's called verification of your model. You do this if you're doing finite element. If you're creating a finite element model, you first verify the solution of that finite element model to a bunch of different problems that are well known and solved. And then you go and try and do something uh, new with it. But here's a problem. It's a beam. It's uh, simply supported. Imagine there's like a bar sticking out of this beam coming at you where I just do that, uh, that dot. And we can just simply take a Put a little bit of torque around that bar. M not. So this thing will have a length of L, and we'll say that this bar is placed the length C away from there. And the question is, how, how do we solve for the deflection of this bar? And the way a Fourier series works, a Fourier series is nothing more than just the infinite sum of sine curves. Okay, so you've probably seen this before. But what we would say is, let's guess the deflection. So my deflection of my beam is going to be, I don't know, something like this. And we're going to say, let's guess the deflection. Our deflection, if you remember, is given by the variable w, because it'll be a vertical deflection. And our deflection is a function of space, right? So because w is going to be depend on where you are on the beam. So w is actually a function of x. And a powerful tool for guessing the solution, this beam, is to say, I think I could probably assume that my deflection could be approximated by adding up a bunch of sine curves. So you could say, I'm going to take some coefficient A1, which is the amplitude of this sine curve, times the sine of pi x over L. I'll add to that another curve. 
a2 times the sine of 2 pi x over L. And a third curve, a3, has the sine of 3 pi x over L. Keep going. This is, uh, we can imagine going forever. So if we can imagine going forever, then we can really write this as a, oops, nope, 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 nope. The sum from n equals one to infinity of a sub n sine n pi x over L. I thought it might be useful for you to get some uh, conceptual understanding of this. And by that, I mean, let me stop sharing for a second. You've probably, if you already understand Fourier series, great. You can just kind of tune out for a second, but if, if it might be helpful to uh, think about what we're doing, what we're doing is this. So I've, I've just taken so look up here. This is what I wrote on on my on my thing where a one sine pi over uh, x over l. I chose l to be one here, so x is think of x over l as just x from zero to one. So this is a sine n equals one plus a two sine two n x plus a3 sine 3nx. And I'm just going to play with this. And so this is the, the idea is to say, if we just find the right coefficients, a1, a2, a3, a4, a5, we can get a good approximation for the shape of our beam. So here's what sine of uh, 1 pi x looks like. And I can just start playing with the values of my prefactors. And you can start to see that I can start to access kind of any possible shape of a beam that you could kind of dream up. And I've really limited the range of values I've chosen for A here. I'm just picking like zero through two. But the idea is to say that my beam is going to take some shape and that shape can probably be, be found by adding up a bunch of these curves as long as we can find the coefficients. We just need to find those values, A1, A2, A3, A4. And I think another thing that throws off engineers uh, I'll speak at least for myself, is this idea of having a solution that has an infinite sum in it. What do you do with that? Well, what you do in practice is you say, well, obviously we're not going to sum this thing out to infinity. What we are trying to do is to approximate our beam, and we can start to look at how our approximate solution gets better the more terms we include. And at some point, you have to say, like, do I need this to get any better than it already is? We'll do that in a second. I'll go down and I'll show you what I mean by that uh, in a minute. So let me stop this for a second and go back. Hopefully my computer does not die before I get to go back to it again. All right, let me share my... So that's the idea. We guess a function for our deflection. And we use that to write down the we use that to write down the strain energy and the and the work. Now, one subtlety that's that's important to note is that the function you choose needs to satisfy the boundary conditions. So, for a simply supported beam, we know a couple of things. We know that the deflection at L, oops, I'm not sharing, am I? Why didn't I just click share? Oh, no, nope, I didn't. Cool. For a simply supported beam, what we know is that the boundary conditions tell us that the deflection at L and at uh, zero need to be zero. And that <clears throat> there's no moment on the beam when you have a simply supported beam. No moment 
means that the second derivative of your deflection is zero. You might remember that we had an equation that looked like um, <clears throat> kappa, oh, what is it? EI kappa equals your moment. This is like a constituent relation we've used for beam bending. So therefore, our kappa is, we can approximate that as the second derivative. Of our of our deflection, and for small slopes, that's pretty good. So we know that this has to be true. Now, quickly looking at our Fourier sine series, it should be pretty clear that if you put in x is equal to zero, sine gives you zero. If you put in, if you take a derivative of sine, you get cosine. If you take a second derivative of sine, you get back to sine. And so then therefore your second derivatives are already satisfied. So you should be able to convince yourself pretty quickly that by the choice of this series here, we have already satisfied our boundary conditions. That's not always going to be true. A lot of times the trick, just like in the last problem, the homework problem, the trick was kind of like, can I figure out the total potential energy? A lot of times if you're trying to approximate the shape of something, your trick is to find the right function that satisfies the boundary conditions. We'll do that on our next, the next one we work on. Okay. The coefficients that we need to find a one, a two, a three. You can think of those as like the amplitude of each of those individual sine curves. So, like, what's the the scale of the of the sine curve? And typically, what happens is that your coefficients kind of decrease. Like, the first term is the dominant one. And then your second times are smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, let's use this to solve a problem. Your, your bending energy, we know by now is the integral over the length of the beam of the second derivative of W squared. So that's your curvature squared. Okay, so we can, all we need to do now is Take this function, square it, and insert it into our into our integral. So let's see here. If w of x is equal to the sum. of our coefficients times n pi x over L. Then the first derivative is going to be the sum of n Hopefully this looks familiar, right? It's, this, it's going to give you a sign. It's going to take the thing that multiplies x outside the sign. We know that our second derivative is going to do the same thing. We have a sum of a n. Times that whole thing n pi l squared sine of n pi x over l. Not bad. So that's the second derivative. We got back to being a sine. We basically, this term gets pulled out twice, once for each derivative, so therefore it becomes squared. This is unaffected. 
we recover our sine term back. Again, it sometimes freaks people out to take derivatives of things inside of an integral or inside of a summation. Uh, just to just it's not it's it works the same. You can just kind of uh, take the derivative um, even with that summation there. It's just basically saying sum all the terms. And so you can think of it as just like you're you're just doing a derivative of each of the terms in a series that goes on forever. So chromosomes. Yes. So uh, the second derivative, why is that sign not negative? Or is it just because it's in the sum? Let's see, why is that sign not negative? Uh, no, it is negative, but it's not going to matter. That's a good point. Sorry, I lost the negative in my notebook. It totally is negative. Oops. The reason why I was saying it's not going to matter is sorry the reason why i'm saying it's not going to matter and the reason I, I was being sloppy there is that we're about to square it so that negative sign is going to go away but you're totally right thanks for catching that there should be a negative sign out here that was me just being sloppy okay so we have the thing that we need to square that's this we have to insert that into here so Let's remind you what we've done so far. We're trying to solve a beam deflection problem. We guess the deflection could be written as a Fourier series. We know that the strain energy depends on the second derivative of the deflection. So we took our guess, took two derivatives of it, and now we're sticking it inside the strain energy. And so this is where it starts to get a little confusing. But I'm going to try, if my computer doesn't die, to uh, Make it slightly less confusing. Oh, we lost the term, didn't we? We did. There should be a bending rigidity stuck outside here. Sorry. Sorry, sorry. All right, now we're going to square our term here. It's a little bit messy, but do it. All right, so how do we square this term? Well, we square this term by taking two of them, multiplying them together. And the key thing is when we multiply them together, we're going to have a different um, integer value for each of these terms. So what do I mean by that? I mean, we're going to take this and we're going to write it as the sum. of that times the sum oh gosh all over the place today. So the main thing I want you to notice here is that we have the sum of n, and then the second term that we're multiplying here, we've inserted an m. That might have just made it worse. And before my computer dies, 
Let me just show you something that happens that's both weird and confusing, but also actually pretty useful for us. And it's that sine and cosine functions are orthogonal functions. What that means, I can show you visually really quickly, is that when you multiply, so this is right here, I have sine of n pi x times the sine of m pi x. And what I'm doing is I'm going to vary the values of n and m. And what you'll notice is that when n and m are the same, you have some nice curve here. And we're integrating under that curve. So if I integrate under that curve, I'm going to get a number. But look what happens if they're not the same. If I change n, n as 1 and m as 2, then all of a sudden, if I'm integrating under that curve, I'm going to get 0. I'm going to get some positive number and some negative number that's exactly the same. If n and m are both 2, we're happy again. Integral under that curve is going to be a number. If n and m are different, this might not seem obvious, but these two humps, this one and this one, will, will kind of, this one will offset this one, this one will offset this one. The integral under, the, under this curve is going to be zero. If they're equal, the integral under the curves is going to be a number. Again, this will offset this. This will offset this. We're integrating under the curves. All you need to look at is the area underneath these curves. And the key takeaway here is that whenever you have a sine times sine squared, essentially, that if you're integrating over a sine squared term, that term will only have a number if the coefficient n equals m. Put this thing to sleep. Yeah. All right, let's go back to where I was at over here. So let me write that down more formally so you can see what I'm talking about. Hopefully, visually, you now know. You'll know what I'm about to. Uh, you'll be able to see what I'm mean, what I'm saying here. I am trying to take the integral of these two terms. You're not seeing it. Thank you. So I'm trying to integrate over sine of n something times sine of m something. And that integral, so the integral uh, from 0 to L of sine of n pi x over L times the sine of m pi x over L. It equals zero when n and m are different. And it equals a number when n and m are the same. It turns out that it not only equals a number, it actually equals a very specific thing. It equals L over two. You could plug that into Mathematica and it'll spit it out for you. You wouldn't necessarily know that for any reason. But the most important part here is that we only get an answer. Oh, gosh. We only get an answer if these things are the same. So that's nice. That makes our life a little bit easier. And now we can simplify our equation. We know that n and m have to be the same. And therefore, our bending energy looks like EI 
over two times the sum from n equals one to infinity of a sub n squared n to the fourth, because we have an n squared times an n squared pi to the fourth over L to the fourth. And then we know that this integral, when these two things are equal, is just L over two. So we have, we lose all the sign terms and we get just an L over two. We can simplify our life a little bit by pulling some of these terms that don't involve n out of the summation. So we can cancel one of these L's. We can write this as pi to the fourth over four times EI. Or L cubed times the sum of n equals one to infinity of a n squared. So, oops, we lost something too, didn't we? Times n to the fourth. Okay, let me pause here because I've just done a bunch of math. Again, the important thing for you to know. I guess there's a couple of important things. Let me back up and see what we've done. We've said, I want to find the deflection of this beam. We've guessed a function for the deflection as a sum of a bunch of nice curves, smooth curves, Fourier cur uh, uh, sine series. So that's what we've done here. We said, let's just pretend that our deflection will depend on a bunch of sine terms added together. Each of them has uh, a different mode. So mode one, mode two, mode three multiplied by a different constant. We know everything in this equation except the constants. A1, A2, A3, A4, A5. We're summing over N. So, you know, this thing looks like we don't know N, but we're summing over N. The thing we're trying to find is, is A. <clears throat> Actually, a bunch of different A's. We took this term that we guessed for the deflection we note that the bending energy, since this thing is going to bend, the bending energy depends on the second derivative of this function. So we calculate the second derivative. It depends on the second derivative squared. So we had to do a little bit of math to figure out what happens when you square the second derivative. And it turns out that what happens is our problem simplifies really nicely that into the point where you can actually do this integral and you either get zero when these values are not equal to each other, or you get a really simple answer of L over two when they are. And so we just put this back into here. We lost the integral because we actually computed the integral. We integrated underneath the sine squared terms. So that's where we, the integral term goes away because we actually calculated that integral here. And then what we're left with is our bending energy that looks like this. I'll just highlight that. This is our unknown. Questions? What questions do you have for me? We won't, we won't ever be asked to be like derived like these thing in like the in actual problems we can always just mathematica correct or should we get, get ourselves familiar with this no I, I i would do this in mathematica to get to here oh gosh um, yeah you want to i mean you want to do this and i would have probably done it in mathematica had i not been a fool and forgot my core today um but yeah, uh, like the, the orthogonality of these functions 
is like a nice bonus for us that explains why this complicated mess of stuff here simplifies to just a simple summation of a, of a squared term. Like, again, you can think of this as, I, hate, I hesitate to say the word proof, but this is more like uh, the stuff that, that goes on behind the scenes to help you understand how, I guess it's to under, help you understand, like your, your question might be like, why are, I totally get where, where this question is coming from. It's kind, of, it's kind of coming from like, this is unfamiliar to me. Am I going to be expected to know this? And I guess what I'm trying to do is to say, isn't it weird that we picked a sine series to sum over? Like, why did we pick that? We could have picked polynomials or picked some other crazy curves. And the reason we picked a sine series is because it has these nice uh, simplifications there that help us take this kind of mess and make it easier to work with. So it's almost like, my, my short answer to your question is no, I don't need you to be able to remember orthogonality conditions for trig functions. But I guess what I'm trying to show you is we didn't just pick these sign series just to mess with you. It, there's a lot of nice features of trigonometric functions, orthogonality being one of them. And orthogonality is just what you're seeing here and what I was trying to show you in those graphs. So the choice of that function it's really useful because of all these ways that it can get simplified. Does that make sense? And so I was trying to just show you kind of why it's a powerful choice for our guests. All right. Well, this is one half of it, right? So let's let's zoom out for a second. To find our the actual deflection of our curve, we have to note that the first variation of our total potential energy will be zero. We have the strain energy, we need the work. If um, work done by a force is the force times the displacement in the direction of the force, Work when you have a moment is the moment times the slope at that point, right? Work's going to be an energy is a force times displacement is units of energy. A moment already has units of energy, so you need to be multiplying that by a slope. Or to think of it a different way, a moment causes rotation, a force causes deflection. So your moment causes like a rotation around a point. So you're looking at the, the cause and effect. The moment times the rotation is going to be your, the work that this thing is doing. And remember, what we've done here is we have we have a point in which we apply a moment, and we expect that's going to cause some slope there. So this is the strain energy. Now let's look at the work. Work's going to be the moment we applied times the slope. That's not too hard. We already did the first derivative, right? We did it up here. Uh, Not bad. So we just need to take our M not term, multiply that by the sum, of n equals one to infinity of a sub n times ah, n pi. over L times the cosine of N pi X over L. There's no integral here, right? This thing is just a, that moment is applied at a point. 
So the work is really simple. We don't have to do any of the stuff that we just did with orthogonality and integrating over the length of beam. We just have a, uh, a moment being applied at a, at a specific point. So this is our work. Now up here, we wrote the following. If the, if the minute, principle of minimal potential energy tells us the first variation of your total potential energy has to be equal to zero for your structure to be in equilibrium. And if the V is the difference between the strain energy and the work, then the first variation in V will be equal to the first variation in U minus the first variation in the work. Therefore, the external work that we're doing needs to be stored as internal strain energy. Delta U needs to balance delta W. Okay. So we have these two things. What we need are delta U, delta W, and we need to set them equal to each other. Take a second and calculate delta U and delta W. Remember, our first variation is just simply the partial derivative of that thing. With respect to what? That's the question. Again, we're typically thinking about virtual displacements. So the question is, the virtual work is determined by the virtual displacements. The perturbation of the strain energy is by assuming a, 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 a small change in the, in the actual displacement. So you have to ask yourself, what in my equation is a displacement? And that takes us back to the fact that the amplitude of our sine function is a displacement. It, it, the AN tells you that amplitude of each of those sine terms. And you can kind of see that up here. Like, let's go back to our Fourier equation up here. Uh, let me circle this thing in red. This is the equation here. Sine of whatever is a number. Deflection or def displacement W is a unit length. So if sine of something is a number, then just by dimensional analysis, a sub n has to be a deflection or a displacement or a, a, something of unit length. We know that conceptually what it is, is it's the maximum amplitude of our, of our sine terms. And so the first variation is found by taking the partial derivative of our uh, strain energy with respect to those amplitudes, those displacements. And then we multiply that by our kind of virtual displacement delta a n. 
So that should give you on the strain energy pi to the fourth over two EI over L cubed times the sum of n equals one to infinity of a sub n times delta a sub n times n to the fourth. The work work is the exact same approach. The variation, the virtual work looks like the derivative of your work with respect to a sub n times the virtual displacement. And that really looks basically identical, except we replace <clears throat> a sub n with delta a sub n. How are we doing? Are people following or any questions? Now we have to remember what we're doing here. We, we guessed the solution. If we guess the solution, which is the deflection of our curve, the only thing that we don't know is the coefficients on our Fourier series, a sub n. And now we have the fact that our virtual, our, our first variation, our total potential energy has to be zero, which means that the first variation in our strain energy has to equal the first variation in our work. And so these two equations have to be set equal to each other. So I can write that out. Pi to the fourth over two, EI over L cubed. And what you'll notice is that our virtual displacements go away. They go away because there's a virtual displacement in our strain energy and a virtual displacement in our work. And when you equate those two terms, they cancel out. So this thing that we don't know goes away because of this thing. And then we're left just solving for a sub n. And to do that, it's a little bit weird. You can do this in mathematics if you prefer, but you're effectively dividing by the sum of n to the fourth. Right, you're effectively dividing by this. We're solve, we want to solve for, let's do this properly. We want to solve for this thing, a sub n. Because that's the un only unknown in this equation up here, which is the that's our guess at the solution. To do that, we need to divide by this summation, which kind of looks confusing. Um, but what it's going to end up doing is is essentially moving over here and canceling out with uh, one of these ends right here. So if we solve for a sub n, I'll show you what that looks like. Mm 
A sub M is equal to two times the moment times L squared. You have an L cube on the left hand side, and L on the right hand side. This is going to be a pi to the third. And then you have a one over n cubed cosine n pi c over l. Oh yeah, I forgot to say something actually here. Sorry, everyone. There's one mistake I made. And that mistake is that this is not the work. This is the moment occurring at a point. And I should have written that as instead of the moment along X, this should be C. That's where we apply the moment. It doesn't do anything to our math. I just carried an annoying typo all the way through. Sorry. That's because up here, this moment is applied at X is equal to C. So the work is kind of like how the, the work on the bar problem was force times the displacement at L, this is moment times the rotation at C. So apologies there. So that looks kind of awful. But the one thing I want to highlight to you and then we'll see if my computer does. Uh, the one thing I want to highlight to you is that look at this a sub n here. It goes as one over n cubed. That means the magnitude of the coefficients a sub n drops off really fast. As you get out to n is equal to four, five, six, you're cubing that. The value of that. A, each coefficient for each value of n is going to drop to zero really, really, really fast. What that means is we were talking about at the beginning about how I think as engineers are often uncomfortable with the idea of saying my solution requires me to sum from zero to infinity. How do I do that? Well, in fact, you don't need to do that. And in this, in this particular problem, as you'll, as I'll show you in a moment, the coefficients essentially go away once you get out to like the third or fourth coefficient. So you really need to sum to like n equals three, and then your error is going to be incredibly small at that point. So we've just approximated the deflection of a beam by guessing the function, applying the principle of minimal potential energy, and solving for the unknown coefficients for my guess. Let's take a a break, feel free to pop me, uh, throw any questions at me either in the chat or out loud. And then I'll, if my computer's not dead, I'll try to show you how the solution looks so that it stops looking like a mess of equations and looks like something useful. But let's take a break until like 10, 16 or something. Can you apply that to a family that is supported at both ends? That guess? Yeah. Yes. Um, what I'll show you, I think next, I think this is what we work on next, um, is that the for a cantilever beam, it's kind of the other really main common beam you encounter. The, the hard problem is actually finding the right curve. And in that case, the sum of the sine functions doesn't work. And I'll show you why. But the reason why it doesn't work is because it doesn't match the path conditions. Um, and so for the Fourier series method, you have to pick a function that satisfies the boundary conditions. The next method we'll look at is slightly different. It looks really similar. It's really common, it's super commonly used. It's called the Rayleigh Ritz method. And it, um, in that case, you 
only have to satisfy some of the boundary conditions. And then, but the, the approximate answer isn't as good. So it's kind of like a trade off. Um, but yeah, so anything that's simply supported, you, this one will work fine. When you have something that's clamped and loaded at the end, um, this one's not going to work. And I'll show you that, I think, we'll show that next. Yeah, I think that's probably what we'll work on after this. But yeah.
Okay. I have 4% battery, but I want to show you what this solution looks like. Let's see if it works. Oh, it didn't work. All right. Well, what I was going to show you is that it takes like three terms for this thing to collapse to the analytical solution. I'll post the Mathematica notebook uh, to the website so you can play with it. It'll have some dynamics, which means Mathematica is going to yell at you when you try to open it to say, do you want to enable these dynamics? It could be a virus. It's not a virus, just a slider bar. Um, and it'll allow you to see what the analytical solution is, because this is a problem that has an analytical solution. And it'll allow you to see how the approximate solution does. If you just keep one term, it does pretty terribly. It looks kind of like a sine curve, which is not right. If you do, uh, I think it's like three terms, you see it just start to collapse directly onto that analytical solution. Um, it works really well. It's a really nice way of approximating these things. It's really useful for problems that are that we're unable to, to solve exactly, which are for the most part most problems in, in structural mechanics. There was a question during the break of like, does this Fourier series guess for W always work? Um, or I think it was specifically for does it always work for simply supported beams? And, and, and it, the answer is the way to know if your series works is to check to see if it satisfies the boundary conditions. So that's what we did up here. This is kind of like a sneaky important part here. These are the boundary conditions. There should be no deflection at the two ends of the beam, and there should be no moment, which means there should be no curvature at two ends of the beam. And we kind of quickly checked with ourselves that those two conditions are satisfied by this Fourier series. Let me give you an example of when they're not. So, Oh gosh. So here is a here's a cantilever beam with a vertical force at the end, magnitude of P. This beam has a length of L. And we want to use this method of a, a trigonometric series to approximate the deflection of this beam. Again, this is a problem we can solve analytically, but we're trying to make the, 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 the point of how do you actually do this and test it on a problem that we know the answer so we can use it on problems that we don't later. And so your first thought you could, you, could, you could say is, well, let's just, just try our normal guess. Let's guess that let us guess that we're going to use a Fourier sine series. And what you do at this point is we have a guess. In order to evaluate if that's a good guess, you check the boundary conditions. So what are the boundary conditions on this cantilever beam? The boundary conditions are one, that there's no deflection at the clamped end. That's pretty obvious. And hopefully you remember that the second boundary condition is that there is no slope at the clamped end, which means that, the ball, that no matter what, that bar goes into the wall and, it has, and it's orthogonal to it. You might have deflection way over here, but the beam has to bend, so it has to go into the wall orthogonal to it, which means that the slope has to be zero at that wall, which means that the first derivative has to be zero 
at x is equal to zero. So now we check and we say, okay, I need to know what is the first derivative of my function. We've we've already calculated this, but w prime of x is equal to the sum of n equals one to infinity of a sub n, n pi x, oh, not n pi x, sorry, n pi over L times the cosine of n pi x over L. And we know cosine functions are not equal to zero when x is equal to zero. So this is not going to work. And the reason is this is not going to work is because of this term here. So let's try again. We know that we want the derivative to be zero. We know that we want to use a trig function. So it might make sense. We know that sine would give us the zero there. And we know that to get sine as the first derivative, we should choose a cosine function. So why don't we choose that our Fourier trig series is a is a, a cosine series instead? So we'll do guess number two. Guess number two is that why don't we just pick a cosine? Because a cosine will give us a derivative get to be with sine. I will emphasize to you that in using these approximate methods, guessing the function is usually the one that takes you the most amount of time. But it's also pretty straightforward. Like I know that I need to match my boundary conditions. I know that I need to match the, the we've only matched two of them here. I'll show you what happens in a second, but it's it's more tedious than it's difficult. Okay, the boundary conditions again, let's check. Well, now we've got another problem. My deflection at zero is gonna equal one. Right, sine of whatever. And my, but my first derivative works now. So my first derivative is what? That's going to give me negative sum from n equals one to infinity of a sub n pi over l sine of n pi over l. That does equal zero at x is equal to zero because of this term. So we're good there. So we're like almost there. We have the first derivative term matching, but now we have this pesky one in the way. So we have to get rid of the one. So maybe a better guess for our function, we'll go to guess number three, would be why don't we guess that our function, if we have to get rid of that one, why don't we simply say that our function is sum from n equals one to infinity of a sub n times one minus the cosine of n pi x over l. Now, whenever we pick w is equal to zero, we get zero. because the one goes away. And 
Whenever we take the first derivative, that one doesn't matter at all because it goes away when we take the derivative. It also equals zero, and so we're happy. Unfortunately, we're not done. And why are we not done? We've only looked at the conditions on the clamped end of the beam. We haven't said anything about the free end of the beam. And so what you could do is, again, you have a guess. So the important thing about a guess, and especially using something with Mathematica, is that you're basically saying, I know the deflection of my beam. It should be something like 1 minus cosine or whatever. You can just plot that and look at what those curves look like. And I wish I hadn't completely forgotten my charger because I would have been able to show you what that looks like. Well, I'll try to draw it and make up for it now. So here's the problem with our third guess. If I plot my deflection from zero to L, If I was to plot this function, for different values of n, so let's take n equals 1, what you would find is that it looks like that, right? It's a cosine term. We'll do another one. Let's go light blue for n equals, this is, sorry, this is n equals 1. This is n equals two. It'll be uh, and we could do n equals three, but I think you get the point. What's the problem with these curves? Or to put it a different way, if I push down on that cantilever. Do you think those blue curves are look like what the deflection of the beam is going to be? I'll take your resounding silence as a no. What is the beam going to look like when you deflect it? Like sketch it on your notebook. And once you sketch the beam deflection on your notebook, what do you think the slope should be at that free end. Your options are two. Your slope could either be zero at the free end or not zero. Not zero, exactly. There's, there's no reason why the slope should be zero at that free end. If the slope is zero at the free end, that means you're applying a moment there. Well, we're not applying a moment there. We're not applying any torque at the free end of that beam. But no matter what n you choose here, you're going to get something. Look, our beam, this thing has no slope here. That has, that's coming, that beam is being deflected with no slope. n equals two, no slope. n equals three, no slope. So we actually, it's almost like we're taking too much of the curve. What we really wish we could do is maybe do something like this. Like, what if I took this is like L over two? I bet if you go from zero to L over two, that curve looks a lot closer to your deflection that you drew in your notebook. Well, we're just making stuff up here. We're just guessing. So there's no reason why we can't alter our function again. 
for a fourth guess. All we did is we said instead of going from zero to L, we should go from zero to kind of two L. Um, if you're hoping we're done, we're not. This doesn't solve our problem either. But we're almost done. So we want to go half of x over l. We don't want to go all the way to x over l. We want to go half of x over l. And so we'd say we go n pi half of x over l. And that, and I'm going to draw that in a, let's see, let's pick that. That corresponds to those types of deflections. The reason why we're not done is because of these pesky even number values. Because look, for n equals one, we're happy. That looks like you're drawing. For n equals two, N equals two. Uh oh, we have that moment problem again. My slope is zero there. So, what do we do? It's not really that easy to alter our function to get rid of that. So, what we do is we say, well, if, if, I, if we can look at this in mathematica or some other way of plotting, what you would find is that every time you have an odd integer, it's right. The, the slope is finite there. And, the, and there's. Um, and every time you have an even integer, there's no slope at the end of the beam. So you just say, all right, fine, I'm going to guess one more time. And I'm going to say, this time, I'm only going to sum over the odd integers. This gives you some like n equals three is probably not that easy for you to conceptualize, but let me show you. N equals three looks like uh, like that. Oops, that should be going to. Oh gosh, like that. It's got a slope there. It's not the slope we want. I probably do that kind of poorly, but uh, it's it's got a slope there. So we now have a guess that works. This guess satisfies all the boundary conditions at the clamped end where there's no deflection and there's no slope, and at the free end where there should be some deflection and some slope. At this point, we repeat our procedure. We insert this into our strain energy. You're going to get the same stuff. Let me let's solve this problem just for the sake of time. I'll go quickly. We want to do the same thing. We want to set this equal to this. And this is just because of the first variation being equal to zero. The work is really easy because the function that we guessed at x is equal to L is the deflection, right? So the, oops, I don't want to do that. I want to do work is going to be the force P times our guess. But 
I did it again, is that x is equal to L. And so this becomes sum of the odd integers. n pi l over l is one, so it's that. And our strain energy, let's do this one again. This is going to be e i over two, zero to l, second derivative squared. I'm going to quickly do the derivative for you. We've already done one of them. Now, again, there's a question of, do I need to remember all this derivation of the orthogonality stuff? No, but what I would like you to remember is, if I see a sum of a Fourier or a trig series squared, something's gonna help make this simpler. That's what I would like you to remember. Hey, look, I have the sum of a trig series squared. There's probably a way that this gets simplified. I'm integrating over that sum of the trig series squared, which means that due to orthogonality, again, just like the last time, we're only going to get an answer here when our integers are the same, and it's going to be the same answer we had last time, L over 2. That's why these trig functions are so useful. They simplify dramatically. So I'm just going to write this down. No, I don't need you to know how to do this by hand. But yes, I would like you to be able to identify that, hey, I'm squaring this trig function and I'm integrating over it. I think that gets simplified somehow. And so we're almost done. My strain energy then just becomes, just like last time, it's very similar, pi to the fourth, EI. We have a huge number out here now. Oops, no, I don't want to do that. And lastly, we have to do what we did last time, which is take the variations of these things. Oops. Again, that's really easy to do. Take the derivative. Take the derivative with respect to our displacement, our unknown displacement, a sub n, and then multiply that by a virtual displacement. These are not hard derivatives to take. We end up with the first variation of our bending energy is going to be pi over 4 EI over 32 L cubed, sum over the odds, and the fourth A sub n delta A sub n. And then our work. The virtual work becomes the sum of the odds. From, and then this just becomes delta a sub n 
times all that stuff. One minus cos two pi over two. I mean, sorry, n pi over two. And then our lastly, the principle of minimum potential energy says take this thing and this thing, set them equal to each other, and find the one thing we really want. And the one thing we really want is our unknown coefficients of AF. Sorry for going fast here. If you do that, if you solve for a sub n, what you will find is that a sub n equals 32 PL cubed over n to the fourth pi to the fourth EI. And look, once again, we have another really nice approximation. One over n to the fourth. That means, again, we're not going to need to keep many terms in this series before it converges to a value that, we, that is the answer. And in fact, if we just keep, if we insert this back into our guess, so we take this thing and we insert this back up here, and we just keep the first three terms, so n equals 1, 3, and 5. And our maximum deflection, which is the deflection at x is equal to L, is equal to PL cubed over 3.001 EI. This is our approximate solution. Can anyone guess what the exact solution is? Exactly, it's PL cubed over three EI. So we did pretty well. This is not bad. So the max deflection exact is PL cubed over three EI. And I, I want I'm pointing this out because for one thing, it took us 10 minutes on pen and paper to calculate this approximate method. But the second thing is we only had to keep three terms. And then our error is remarkably small. And the third thing is the trickiest part is guessing the function. And I will just add to that for you that one, you're guessing. So you're allowed to just kind of play with the function like we did. Like, oh, let's just go for half the width. Let's just switch it from sign. Let's minus a one here. We're making a guess. How do you know if your guess is any good? Plot it. And see if it matches your boundary conditions. If you know there can't be a slope at the at the clamp end, then there better not be an angle at x is equal to zero. If you know that you're not applying a moment at the free end, then there better not be a zero slope at the free end. And you kind of work your way through, just like we did here, through this system of guesses, until you get a function that at least matches your boundary conditions. And at that point, if you have a function that matches your boundary conditions, you can then insert it and it will get you really close to the, to the final solution, the true solution. All right, that's all I have for you today. There's homework due next week. Uh, and I think we'll do one more class on approximate stuff on Tuesday. Yeah, or maybe one or two, we'll see. But Sounds good. Have a nice weekend, everyone.